situated in the Mackenzie Delta of the Northwest Territories, Aklavik is a small hamlet of around 600 people. Its residents are primarily Inuvialuit, the Western Canadian Inuit people, and the Gwich'in First Nations. Both share a strong connection to traditional lifestyles and the land. The community's motto, Never Say Die, came about in the 1960s when it was decided the community should be moved because of flooding. Determined not to lose their home, many residents chose to stay and to this day continue to call a clavic home. Recently, people began noticing the community members were dying from cancer. Stomach cancer was of special concern with the news that many people were being diagnosed with Helicobacter pylori infection, a bacteria that is a known risk factor for stomach cancer. The community decided that they needed answers, and so a research project was established. The Canadian North Helicobacter Pylori Working Group, or CANHELP for short. The goals of the project are to address the concerns about Helicobacter pylori infection, to recommend management strategies to health authorities, and to reduce the health risks from infection. The project is ongoing, and thanks to the dedication from the community and health researchers, the town's motto remains just as important today as it was 50 years ago. It was pretty well started off by a couple of people who were who had H. pylori and who indicated that you know there might be a lot of people who have it. My whole family died of cancer in the stomach or some sort of cancer. My brother, over 20, 30 years ago. The um, Can Help Working Group came together out of an interest in studying community concerns about health risks from H. pylori infection in northern Canada. Well, what in the past, with all this, this stuff that was happening, you know, being in a community this size, a lot of um, people got sick and weren't feeling good and didn't understand what was going on. This was uh, started back in the mid-80s when I sat on Hamlet Council. And it's one of the issues that why I kept bringing back to council in regards to cancer rates in the community. And I think it was um, a lot of talk, but people just didn't have the resources or the appropriate group to approach to address the issue. During the start, we, through Arctic Health Research Network, uh, Dr. Karen Goodman was recognized with her work in third world countries with H. pylori. Our motivation is to ad address the concerns that have been voiced by community members and try to help find solutions to these concerns. It's been fabulous working with the Can Help Working Group because we're working with a very dynamic team. We have the clinical gastroenterologists, we have epidemiologists and uh, experts in public health care, as well as uh, pathologists who do the scoring of the biopsies to look at the severity of the disease, um, working with people like myself who are microbiologists. What makes the Can Help Project unique is that the researchers work in partnership with the community. By including local health authorities in the group, they are able to focus on community priorities to develop solutions. We've been working with the H. pylori team in regarding uh, consent forms and how the study will be done, conducted. Yeah, I think being community driven puts a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of relevance to, 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 to this research because I know real well that the outcome of at least the pathologic part of it will mean a lot to the community. Any group of doctors coming to a community to take a look at the health of the community is welcome. And um, I think it was really good because um, being a small community, worldwide, we're, we, we feel good about this thing coming to our community and helping us. And we also hear a lot about how everyone is really impressed with the way we're being so comprehensive in studying H. pylori. So we're not just screening people, but we're we did the scope testing and we were able to get those individual results back to everyone and we did the participation study to find out what everyone wanted to get out of the research 
And we've also been doing the treatment trial and other aspects like that. I think it's really exciting that a community is so actively involved in their own health that they're interested in the research process that could potentially benefit their health care. For the people who had it, you know, it, I think everyone who has it knows what, what it is and, you know, what, what affects or, you know, what it causes or what it can cause. So. Helicobacter pylori, or H. pylori for short, is a bacteria, a microscopic organism that is invisible to the naked human eye. H. pylori lives in the stomach lining of humans, where it causes an inflammation called gastritis. Gastritis can cause abdominal upset and pain, but is often mild and many people will not experience any symptoms at all. People who do present symptoms may complain of stomach pain, nausea, or vomiting. If H. pylori infection is not treated, these symptoms may develop into more serious problems, such as stomach ulcers or, very rarely, stomach cancer. H. pylori has been around for thousands of years. Worldwide, it is believed that 50% of people are infected with H. pylori. It is generally lower in developed countries such as Canada, but higher in communities with overcrowded housing or other sanitation issues. Well, H. pylori infection uh, can present in a variety of ways. Uh, definitely can present as an acute disease or sometimes present more of a chronic disease, and sometimes there is the combination of the two. Now, the interesting thing about this organism is that many, many people are infected, but the large majority uh, have actually no idea that this is the case. You know, most of the time the bacteria is not, um, doesn't hurt us, you know, and may cause some discomfort and things like that, but it, most of the time it doesn't hurt us. Now I think a lot of you are also aware that there is a connection there by, uh, between having Helicobacter pylori infection and the possibility of developing stomach cancer, gastric cancer. Now we know that that has been definitely a concern also in the aquatic community. I can tell you that fortunately the risk of this happening to an individual patient is low. It's less than 1%. Science can solve problems much in the way that puzzles are solved where we work out little bits of them at a time in order to benefit from what science has to offer in terms of addressing concerns like health risks from H. pylori. We have to be patient and understand that we may learn just little bits at a time and we may not have a, a big breakthrough. One of the questions that scientists try to answer is who might be at risk for getting H. pylori. To do this, they ask people questions about potential factors like diet or family history and attempt to correlate this with H. pylori infection. To find out who is infected with H. pylori, people need to be tested. So there's three basic ways you can test for Helicobacter pylori infection. Uh, the first way is probably the most common way that most people know about it. It's called a breath test. The second way is a stool test, which is a little bit newer and not as widely available. The third test is to have a scope test done where they actually take biopsies of your stomach and they look for the bug hidden in the lining of your stomach. In Klavik, the primary way that people were tested was with the urea breath test. Patients start by giving an initial breath sample to establish a baseline. They then drink a solution containing urea. If H. pylori are present, they will break down urea, producing ammonia, as well as a labeled carbon dioxide. A second breath sample is taken, and if it contains the labeled carbon dioxide, then H. pylori is present. Um, we tested over 300 people who participated, um, who got a breath test, and 58% of those people had a positive test result suggesting that they have H. pylori infection. All my insights are okay, but I, I, I tested positive and went through the treatment and I took a breath test again and still tested positive, so I got to go through an, a different kind of treatment, I guess. So. While breath testing was the main way that people in a clavic got tested, scoping, or endoscopy, was also used. So endoscopy is basically a, a video optic flexible tube as you can see here, and you can see with the wheels that I'm moving, we can look left and right uh, once we are inside uh, somebody's uh, stomach. While examining the stomach, 
Doctors also collected tissue samples of the stomach lining to be examined by an anatomical pathologist. Yeah, anatomical pathology is a very interesting specialty. It's not really well known, but uh, we do a lot of work, let's put it this way, behind the scene. In the labs, there is uh, multiple steps that will have to happen before I actually have a chance to look at those slides. So they take them from those containers that they were transferred in from Aclopic, and they transfer those tissue to certain uh, uh, plastic blocks. So, so this is, for example, uh, is one of those paraffin blocks uh, for which in eventually the tissues that are procured during the scope end up really being so small little pieces of tissue in this paraffin block, and then that block is mounted on a specific machine by which uh, very thin slices are cut. Eventually, those uh, small thin section are actually put down on what we call here a water bath. And eventually, uh, that piece of tissue will be transferred to a glass slide. So those pieces of tissues are exactly the same pieces of tissue on that glass slide. The only difference is that this glass slide has been stained. That's why it looks a little bit more reddish. And this is eventually is what I will put under the microscope here and examine. The pattern of inflammation, ulcers, and tissue damage seen in a clavic is characteristic of populations that are more at risk for stomach cancer. In the tissue samples examined with the microscope, 90% of people with H. pylori were found to have moderate to severe inflammation, which is higher than in most other parts of Canada. So we, we used scoping as one of the ways we were testing up in a clavic because we wanted to actually get tissue samples so we could look to see if there was any damage to the stomach lining as well as to try to grow the bacteria in a culture medium to see if we could test it to see if there were antibiotics that it would be more or less susceptible to. I had H. pylori three times in one year. And um, with H. pylori, I think what happens is that they have to have certain kind of medication for certain levels of H. pylori. The problem is, is there is an increasing resistance to antibiotics in Helicobacter pylori infections like throughout the world. And so it's really important to do that testing to determine whether or not um, we're using the right drugs to treat those individuals. So when the biopsies arrive, they arrive in a bag like this. It's a biohazard bag. And you might be surprised to see how small the biopsy vial actually is. And with that sample, we have to break it up with a piece of equipment called a homogenizer so that we can free the bacteria from the sample and spread it out to what we call culture media. And we spread out the homogenized sample on here and then we incubate it uh, for about at least two days and sometimes up to three weeks at 37 degrees under low oxygen conditions. If we were able to successfully culture the Helicobacter pylori, in the lab, what we're interested in doing is determining what antibiotics this bacteria is susceptible to so that we can treat the individual and cure them of this infection. So in Canada, the typical regimen that's used is a stomach medication called a proton pump inhibitor. You do take that for two weeks and then you take two antibiotics for another uh, two weeks. So it works in the average person probably about 80% of the time. So that means for every 10 people that you treat, there's going to be two people that aren't going to be successful. It's a very tricky bug to treat. So with the treatment trial, we were hoping to find out if we could treat H. pylori a little bit more effectively. So we used uh, the traditional regimen that I just talked about as well as an alternative regimen that uses more antibiotics and a slightly different pattern. In the people that were treated with the standard therapy, about two-thirds of them were able to get rid of the bug and the people that had the different therapy, 77% of them were able to get rid of the bugs, so the number looks better. It, it's nice if we find the right antibiotics for it, but if it's still out there and, and it's still reoccurring, it kind of defeats the purpose. In addition to learning which antibiotics H. pylori is susceptible to, scientists are also studying the bacteria to learn more about what factors the bacteria has that might make it more likely to cause disease when it's living in someone's stomach. You know, there's only one question now is to try and figure out where, you know, how it originates or where it comes from. I mean, people have their assumptions that it's the water, it's feces in the water, it's, you know, like our sewage lagoon being too close to our water supply. And uh, that's one thing we're w I, I think we're waiting for, and yet we kind of know 
or kind of feel it's the ground and the water and the, you know, the air, the environment that's uh, causing the sickness. Um, we've learned in, um, in a clavic that people are particularly concerned about water as a source of H. pylori infection possibly. Um, and this brings us into um, a difficult challenge for what, this, what science has to offer in um, addressing and, and learning and understanding about where H. pylori comes from. Despite a lot of research around the world aimed at finding out how people get H. pylori, an environmental source has not been pinpointed. While this has not ruled out the possibility that it may be transmitted through contaminated water, there is no evidence to date that suggests that water in a clavic is linked to H. pylori infection. What we do know about it is that um, it clusters in families and we see patterns that suggest that it likely gets spread directly from one person to another through contact, the way many germs get spread. So what this tells us is that um, there are some indications among the participants in the Clavic H. pylori project that um, there are reasons to be concerned about the impact that H. pylori may be having on a large number of, of people who live in communities such as, such as a clavic. Many people in a clavic were concerned about H. pylori in their community and wanted to contribute to finding solutions. The results show that H. pylori infection is greater in a clavic than in many other parts of Canada. While 90% of the cases studied showed moderate to severe inflammation, there were a variety of treatment options to help cure people of their infection. Other communities in the North have expressed an interest in the type of research that the CanHelp Working Group has done. As the research expands, the H. pylori puzzle in Northern Canada will become a little closer to being completed. I think, I think, I think the most important thing is for the community to, to, to realize that this is not something to be taken lightly. You know, hopefully this exercise too will, will get us thinking as to, as to um, um, bacteria and things like that within us as to trying to be more healthy, healthier and eat, eat better. And, you know, it's, it's something that is important to us. I'm so happy that this project was in the clavic because um, a lot of people um, feel good now. A lot of people are looking forward to, you know, like feeling good about themselves and everything. And we have a beautiful land, and I want people to feel good and be healthy with what they what they're going through, so we can enjoy the beautiful land that the Lord has given us.